tell us what, what's the biggest, you know, what are the biggest threats to sharks? The biggest threats to sharks right now is definitely overfishing. Um, and a lot of that's being driven by the demand for shark fin soup in Asia. And what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years is the, uh, the buying power in China, mainland China in particular, has, has gone up as the Chinese economy has expanded. And so uh, we understand now up to 72, sorry, oh, sorry, off that bit. Is that all right to begin with that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah do it again. Run it again, okay. So. Uh, what are the biggest threats to sharks right now? Well, the biggest threat to sharks is definitely overfishing. Um, and the overfishing is partly due to the industrial fishing practices we employ today, but also it's due to the demand for shark fin. In the last 10 or 15 years, the demand for shark fin soup has spread from places like Hong Kong and Singapore to Taiwan, and then now to mainland China. And as the economy of mainland China has expanded so much in the last 10 or 15 years, so the demand for shark fin soup has. And we believe now uh, fins from up to 73 million sharks a year are being used for shark fin soup. And what is shark fin soup? Shark fin soup is a traditional dish. It was traditionally a dish of emperors because it's very hard to prepare. So traditionally, it was only being consumed by a very small number of people, very wealthy people. What's changed is that now it's affordable to literally tens of millions of people. And so uh, it's become a commodity like anything else. And consequently, shark populations have been decimated. And so why are people eating shark fin soup? People eat shark fin soup, really, it's a, a prestige thing. The actual fin has absolutely no flavor. The flavor is derived from the stock, which is usually chicken or ham. But the actual cartilage gives texture. And it's seen as a, a prestige dish. So if I were to take you for a, a business dinner, and I wanted to impress you that I was spending a lot of money, I would buy you shark fin soup in the way we might order an expensive bottle of wine in the West. So it seems like a pretty shallow, pretty small, pretty narrow problem. Like, how, well, well, why can't we fix this? Yeah, the, the demand for shark fin soup is, is seen as being traditional, even though a few, only a few people could afford it traditionally. Um, I think the reason there's such sort of obstinacy about switching to alternatives, because there are many alternatives, is in some ways it makes people think they're retaining somehow their, their Chineseness as we're becoming a much more globalized world and the cultures are intermixing and certainly if you've been to China recently it's changed very much in the last 10 or 15 years and I think shark fin is maybe one of those things people use to try and hold on to their identity their cultural identity. If we were going to do one thing to try to protect sharks what would we want to do? Well if there was one measure one silver bullet in shark conservation I think now I'd have to say uh, if China were to ban the sales of shark fin, that would be the silver bullet for sharks because all over the world, sharks are being hunted for the shark fin trade. Most of that is ending up in mainland China. And if there was one conservation measure you could take, which would actually also be quite easy to, uh, to enforce and actually would really change the game for sharks, it would give them a fighting chance as we go forward, it would be that sales ban in China. So are, are there bans on the sale of fins anywhere right now? In 2010, uh, the state of Hawaii banned shark fin sales and processing. Uh, and then the recently, that's happened in Oregon. There's proposals in Washington, California here. We have a, a bill going through the assembly right now, which would ban shark fin sales. And so we see this as a trend that's happening. And we just hope that it will carry on to the main markets in Asia. Do you think we're going to get a worldwide ban on shark fin? Um, a worldwide ban on shark fins would probably be quite difficult. Worldwide bans of any kind are pretty difficult. It's not really necessary. There's not many environmental problems where one country uh, is really sort of 80% plus of the problem. In the case of shark fin, China is 80% plus of the problem. So it's very rare one country can unilaterally pretty much solve an environmental crisis. But in the case of China and sharks, they could do it. Can you give me some numbers on uh, shark populations? Like where are they at? How, how have they gone? What's happening? One of the problems with trying to protect sharks is having people shout behind you of their dog. Um, one of the problems with trying to protect sharks is we don't really have uh, absolute population numbers for any species of shark because when they're in the ocean, you can't really go out and count them. The only data you have is fishing data, and all you can do is compare fishing data from today from historic fishing data. And unfortunately, in many cases, there isn't historic fishing data. But the indications seem to be that uh, in the region of 90% of shark population... Sorry, I'll do that again. I've got myself tongue tied on. One of the big problems with shark conservation is it's impossible to say there are X number of a certain shark species. You can't really go out there and count them. All you can do is look at historical fishing records 
and compare them with today's fishing records and then you can see what changes happen. So when scientists have done that they've found um, pretty drastic population declines in many shark stocks around the world. Uh, some estimates have been a 90% decrease in the last 15 years. So what does that mean for the layperson? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, okay. So, so uh, effectively shark stocks have been decimated in the last 15 years and what that means is not just there's less sharks out there but it means ecosystems have changed because when you take the shark out of an ecosystem there's what we call regime change and uh, you know species mix around some disappear some win some lose and I think one example I've heard recently is the uh, the Northeast Atlantic stocks of cod which were famous for being one of the richest fisheries in the world collapsed 10 or 15 years ago and have never come back even though they stopped fishing and I've heard one account of this being that uh, the whole system has changed and now the role that was being taken by the cod has been taken over by other species because the sharks have disappeared so other animals like skates and rays have taken the place of the cod and therefore the cod has no place in that ecosystem any longer. Wow. So I can do that one again if you want. I was a bit tongue-tied on this whole okay. whatever what does it mean to yeah. the oceans or something. So yeah. what, what, uh, does it matter the shark populations have dropped 90 percent? Well it's not just the loss of shark populations per se that's a problem. What happens when you take a, a keystone predator like sharks out of the ecosystem is the whole ecosystem changes and there's some winners and there's some losers but what you do know is it won't be the same as it was before and there's been various studies done on the effects of removing sharks and in one case uh, in, uh, in the east coast of the United States what they found is when the sharks were removed is that skates and rays and the secondary predators increased. This led to actually a collapse in some of the shellfish populations because the secondary predators like skates and rays were eating the shellfish. So everything changes. Another example uh, I heard uh, the other day was uh, one theory why the cod stocks have collapsed in the Northeast Atlantic. It used to be one of the richest fisheries in the world, the cod fishery off the Northeast Atlantic. But what happened was not only were the cod overfished, but also the sharks were drastically decreased. And now they believe what's happening. The reason the cod hasn't been able to come back in 15 years of protection is the whole system has changed. And so the, the, the place in the ecosystem the cod was occupying has now been taken up by the, the secondary predators the sharks were eating. So that could mean the collapse of one of the, one of the most prolific fisheries in the world, partly due to overfishing of cod, but also due to the overfishing of the sharks. Okay. Yeah, I, got, I hadn't heard that one. We've heard that the other day from an IUCN scientist. Yeah. And he said, because, you know, they think what's partly happened is the, um, the seals have expanded because there's nobody eating the seals anymore. And um, so there's more seals and then there's other fish that come into the role of the cod because the cod's still not back after 15 years. So, I made a movie, Sharkwater. Mm -hmm. If I were to, you know, try to get Sharkwater seen in, in the place that's going to matter the most, well, where should we bring the movie? Well, my personal opinion, I, I'm, I'm an, originally an economist, and, and I believe that if you don't address the demand for these wildlife products, you're never going to solve the problem because everything else is kind of a band-aid. Uh, you know, the real key is stopping the demand for these products, and where the demand is coming for sharks, is in China. So I think uh, the, the place that shark water could have the most impact possible is actually in mainland China. Any uh, advice or strategy for me on getting the movie out in China? Well I think uh, China's market is very different from international markets and I think you have to bring it home to China. Um, something that happens on the other side of the world is not necessarily going to have the impact. And I think uh, what we've found in China is very few people actually understand what's happening to the sharks but they also don't understand the role of China in this and as the economy has expanded so more and more people are able to afford shark fin soup in China and we're literally talking tens of millions of consumers and there really aren't enough sharks left out there to satisfy that demand. So do you think how could how could a movie how could awareness help in China? Well, I think a, a public awareness is incredibly important. Um, you know, we've already seen in our campaigns around the world reductions of up to a third of people stop eating shark fin soup, and that filters back not just to the restaurants, but also even back to the fisheries themselves. So uh, having a, a movie like Shark Water seen in China could affect uh, the lives of a lot of people and turn them off eating shark fin soup, which ultimately I think is the only hope for the sharks is if we can turn down the demand for shark fin soup. Now, while they've done some studies um, that show that there's a serious consumer awareness gap in China with mm -hmm. people knowing mm -hmm. shark fin soup having shark in it. Can, yep. you, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I, 
you really have to, when you're looking at uh, trying to create public awareness in China, you have to kind of throw out uh, your existing rule book, if you like, because even at the level where the, the Mandarin for shark fin soup is actually fish wing soup, it doesn't even mention the word shark. So 70% of people, when we did our survey, didn't even know that shark fin soup contained shark. Sounds silly, but it's a different language and it's a different way of saying it. And then you have to understand that people don't know that sharks reproduce very slowly. They don't know or necessarily understand their top predators. And so they don't realize both that it's got the shark in it, also what's happening to the shark populations. Um, can you give that to me one more time? Yeah. Sort of walking right behind your head. Yeah. So, um, you throw me the question again. Yeah. Can you tell me about um, the awareness in China? Like, mm -hmm. do people know that mm -hmm. their consumption mm -hmm. of this dish is killing one of the biggest, coolest predators the planet has? When we started working in China, we did some surveys to find out what people did and didn't know about sharks. And the first thing, which was amazing, was that many people didn't know shark fin soup contained shark. And that sounds crazy, but when you know that the Mandarin for shark fin soup is actually fish wing soup, it makes sense. So they were assumed this was some part of fish, generic, not that it came from sharks, a top predator, nor that sharks reproduce very slowly, nor that shark populations are being decimated around the world nor did they know the way that fins are obtained and some people believe that fins regrew after they've been removed and what we've found is when people have the information in China and in Chinese communities all around the world when they know what's going on they overwhelmingly want to help the sharks and stop eating shark fin soup. Do you think if people were made aware of the issue with a movie like ours they'd make different decisions? Yes, I think you know people make their consumption decisions based on their knowledge about a product, and you know many people think shark fin is a, a you know a prestigious and, and healthy and clean dish, and uh, if you can raise the awareness of what's going on in sharks, most people I think have a have a good social conscience. They don't want to destroy the shark populations of the world, but they have to have the information. So releasing shark water in China can only help that education. Now there there were some traditional beliefs around shark fin that it was. It has the power to cure disease, or can you give me a little bit of those? Uh? Actually, um, traditional medicine has all kinds of uh, properties endowed to animal parts, but with shark fin, um, really the, the, the superstition, if I can say, around uh, curative products actually comes from the West. And there is some superstition that shark fin or shark cartilage can be a cure for cancer. And this originally, I believe, was from a, a, a book that somebody wrote called Sharks Don't Get Cancer. And actually, sharks do get cancer. So the entire premise was, was wrong. But um, there seems to be some uh, uh, belief that possibility that cartilage can um, reduce cancerous cells growth. Um, eating soup would not be the way you'd administer it. But uh, even that is not proven. Um, I'm going to go for the line again yep, yep. where you say uh, getting shark water to China would be okay. really good because that's yep. an important one for us. Okay. So if we made this film yeah, and we want to, you know, make, like we made the film yeah. to, to save sharks, where should we take it? What should we do with it now to try to make sure it you know, has a bit of an impact? If I was going to release shark water in one country in the world to have an impact to save sharks, it would be China because that's where the awareness of what's happening is the lowest and where the demand for shark fin soup is the highest. Okay. Can you say something like, you've got to get shark water to China? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, yeah. Or like, yeah. we've got to release mm -hmm. shark water in mm -hmm. China, that kind of thing. So what, what should yeah. I do with this movie that we spent yeah. six years in you know, the diet trying to save sharks? Well, I think you've got to get shark water out in China because that's where the market is the biggest and the awareness is the lowest. And I think anything that can be raise awareness of what's happening to sharks is going to be very positive. And I think taking shark water to China would be a great idea. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, how you guys are using celebrities, particularly Yao Ming? We've been working now in China since 2002. And the way we've always gone about our public awareness campaigns in Asia is to work with Asian icons as our spokespeople because it's not really um, very good to have Westerners telling Asian people what to do, but if they have peers and uh, icons like Jackie Chan and Yao Ming who are saying, hey, we shouldn't do this, I think it's much more effective than having Western scientists saying that. So we've now got to the point where we have probably around 80 Asian celebrities who've joined our campaigns for various species. And Yao Ming has been our international ambassador on sharks. And you couldn't really have a better ambassador. He's the most popular celebrity in China. He carried the Olympic flag, uh, at the Olympic Games, he carried the Chinese flag. It was the greatest honor any Chinese, living Chinese has had. And he's also a very articulate and thoughtful young man. And so he's been really leading our campaign in China on shark fin. And what do you hope to achieve with, with Yao Ming? 
Well, our, our original goal was try and reduce demand for shark fin in China through public awareness. Um, as this campaign has gone on, what's been clear is that international treaties like the United Nations CITES Convention is not going to do anything to help sharks, unfortunately. Uh, and we've seen in the, since 1998, since I've been working on this issue, we've really seen very little progress in international fora. So now we believe that the only real way that sharks can have a fighting chance is not only we reduce the demand through public education, but there's actually legislative measures to ban the sales of shark fin. And you're hoping that Yao can help get the public to... Well, I think, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, to do that, to get any sort of ban on, uh, on sales of shark fin, we need to have public support. And I think Yao can be instrumental in getting that out there. And, you know, he, he's quite open about it. He used to eat shark fin and he had no idea where it came from or what was involved. And once he did know that, um, you know, he, he said he didn't want to eat it anymore. And I think that's the model, if you like, is that when people have the information, they understand what's happening. My experience is people in China want to do the right thing and they want to respect nature and they want to help sharks. If we don't uh, turn this around, how long, how long do, they, do sharks have? Well, I think the, perhaps the, the saddest irony of all is that sharks, probably one of nature's most successful species, they've been on the planet around 400 million years. I don't think there's any large animal that's been around that long. And yet I really do believe if we don't do something very soon, we could lose entire species in our lifetime, in literally a generation. It's that close, and I think in some of these cases you get to a point where the population is so low it just can't reproduce and it just collapses, and we're pretty close to that with a number of stocks of sharks, with species I think in our lifetime we could see some go. Now, it is, you know, so goes the shark, so goes everything else? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the other, one of the other th reasons that I was interested in working on sharks is I do think they're a, a flagship for what's going on in the rest of our oceans. So uh, what we're seeing happen to sharks is happening to many other species. They're at the top of the food chain, they reproduce slowly, so unfortunately they may be amongst the first victims, but they're indicative of what's happening in our oceans, which is a, a wanton disregard for populations, for, for dynamics, the bycatch that they're involved in, where they're caught in other fisheries, the, the total waste that's going on. And this is a precious resource, and theoretically it's renewable, but not if we do it the way we're doing it right now. Now, the uh, stats on any other fish or fisheries worldwide, have you got any of those? Well, I think, I, think it's, uh, I think the general estimate now is around 70%, 75% of the world's fisheries are either peaked or in collapse mode or declining. So everywhere around the world, overfishing is a problem. And, um, you know, the, part of the problem is we like to take the animals at the higher end of the food chain. So things like tuna uh, and e even salmon, we're not e eating as much of the sardines and the lower things as we might do. Um, you know, we, it's never a good strategy to take things high up on the food chain. It never tends to be sustainable. Um, tell me about tigers. Well, mm -hmm. what do you, what's happening to tigers around the world? Well, tigers, are, again, are a very sad story. Um, there are thought to be fewer than 3,200 left in the wild. And some of those are in very isolated populations that probably are just going to not be able to find mates to breed in. So it's a pretty dire situation, and it's been going down fairly steadily partly due to uh, habitat loss. There's uh, only a small amount of fragmented habitat throughout Asia where tigers can actually still thrive, but also because of direct hunting for poaching. And unfortunately, there's still something of a market for tiger bone, for tiger skin, uh, and even tiger meat in China. So 3,200 in the wild. I feel like there's more than that in captivity. There are definitely, there's more, more tigers in captivity, I'm told, in the state of Texas than there are in the wild. Um, there's certainly more in cages in China than there are in the wild. It's not very difficult to breed tigers. What's difficult is to have an area where they have enough room to range, where they have uh, enough prey, and where they're safe from poachers. You know, why is it important? Like, you know, I can see with sharks, if we lose all the sharks, yeah, ecosystems could collapse. Mm -hmm. You know, tigers? Like, mm -hmm. Why are tigers important? It's, it's the same kind of thing. I think tigers are important for two, two primary reasons. One, there's a whole system beneath the tiger which exists with you know elephants and uh, deer and a whole range of species underneath them so if you're protecting a tiger in a healthy habitat it means you've got a healthy ecosystem um, beyond that i think uh, the tigers are a huge symbol um, they're massively culturally important in asia and lose if we can't save the tiger you have to beg the question what are we going to be able to save because it i believe it's the world's most favorite animal in a poll recently it's tremendously iconic um, and millions of dollars made from ecotourism from tigers. And if we really can't save the tiger, then it doesn't say much about survival chances of other species and ultimately the survival chances of human beings on this planet. Now, 
what sort of a role does China and breeding of tigers have in all this? Well, in 1992, when the uh, sorry, sorry, in 1993, when international trade in tigers was banned, um, some people in China thought it would be a good idea to start breeding tigers in captivity to uh, secure, I think, a supply of tigers for traditional medicine. And since then, that we believe they've now bred about 6,000 tigers in captivity. Technically, none of those tigers are supposed to have been traded, but we do know that they've leaked out into trade and they've basically been keeping the trade going. Part of our, our strategy to uh, keep attention on these issues is to involve famous people. And um, we're very lucky that Leo DiCaprio has just done a public service announcement with ourselves and World Wildlife Fund, which we know will keep heat on this issue. Uh, and also Sir Richard Branson has become involved and he's partly given money to finance uh, in situ tiger conservation in Corbett National Park in India through Virgin Unite, but he's also lent his name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Part of our uh, strategy to, uh, we call um, conservation through communication is to involve iconic people in, in the issues, to keep it out there in the media, to keep the political will to help these animals. And we've been very lucky with the tigers that Leo DiCaprio has become involved with World Wildlife Fund and ourselves in tiger conservation. And uh, also Sir Richard Branson has become involved, not only in sort of lending his name and image to try and keep awareness going, but also in direct financial support for in situ conservation in Corbett, which is India's oldest national park. It has 150 tigers there. And he's been supporting things like vehicles and equipment for the rangers, which is fantastic. What, um, what do you hope can come from the support of someone like Branson for the tiger cause? Well, I think with, with Richard, we've been talking about doing public awareness events in, in Delhi and in India to keep political will supporting tiger conservation, um, and also in China too. And then also in helping to raise funds to support the projects in the field, support the park services, support the rangers. And Richard's been very helpful in that too. If uh, you were to tackle kids or adults or the lay person in, for all these issues, who would you, who'd you target first? Well, people always say we've got to get the children over because they're the next generation. And I think that's very true. But my experience is kids are pretty, pretty smart. They've got it sussed already. Um, unfortunately, many of these environmental problems, we can't just wait for the kids to solve it. I mean, I think it's as a father myself, it's the most frustrating thing that we seem to park all these projects for future generations to solve, whether it's climate change or anything. We're not like, oh, let's get it solved. It's like, no, put it off, put it off, put it off. And I think we've got to actually roll our sleeves up and take some responsibility. Uh, I heard the other day that we were the first generation whose kids will live uh, less than us due to unhealthy diet. Well, I think we're the first generation that's leaving uh, our next generation way, way poorer because we've, you know, we're, we're destroying the wildlife, we're destroying the wild places. Uh, these are resources which will not be coming back. And so we're leaving our children an impoverished world. So while I think, um, and I love working with children, I think they're very much on board. We've got to deal with ourselves, with our generation, because we need to take responsibility for this. Now, you have kids. Are you at all worried about what the planet's going to like mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, my greatest regret as a parent is the state of the planet we will leave them. They will have problems to deal with which are way further down the line than when we now have the opportunity to deal with it now. And we keep putting things off. We keep, uh, you know, coming up with excuses. Uh, you know, when you th saw things like the Rio summit uh, in 1992 and uh, most of the stuff hasn't been done that was pledged. Um, we're just, well, I kind of, I think we're kind of like, uh, uh, you know, drunken sailors out on a binge. We're, we're like party partying away with the planet's resources. Somebody else is going to have to deal with the hangover. And uh, if that's one thing I could change in the world, it's to leave my children a better world than when I joined it, rather than a depleted world. It looks like the problems are sometimes look pretty enormous to me. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. And I think that might be part of why they haven't been solved. Is that yeah. like, you know, all of these issues stem from the fact that we've sort of built this world that's almost doomed to fail. Our economy draws mm -hmm. upon destroying the natural world and packaging its goods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so much money in these things. How, how, yeah. can, how can we, how can the conservation movement turn this thing around? I think it's, you know, when you look at the world, every economy in the world is built on growth. Now, when you have a finite planet with limited resources, 
It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out you can't grow your way out of problems. Uh, you're going to hit barriers. We're already hitting barriers of fresh water, for example. Um, you know, there's just not enough fresh water left in the world for everybody. The human population has been increasing and increasing. They're now saying over 10 billion. So you've got more people chasing fewer and fewer resources. With such a massive problem around. Well, I think there are so many environmental problems and the scale of things like climate change is so overwhelming that the tendency for people is kind of to shut off and just figure that somehow it'll all sort itself out, which of course is also the most dangerous thing we can do. So I think, you know, you've got as an individual, you've got to break it down into pieces that you can directly affect and make whatever changes you can in your life. But I think we've got to really seriously consider the whole basis of our system that we live in and where, you know, every country is built on the process of or assumption of growth, economic growth. But that's growth that comes from not just self-generating, but from depleting natural resources. And clearly that's not sustainable. It's a very basic thing. And I think we've also got to look seriously even at our political systems where if we're only having a government in for four or five years, uh, that might be great in terms of getting rid of people that are bad, but it doesn't make for long-term decision making. It doesn't make for people to take responsibility for the long term. And I think there must be some kind of different system where we can still maintain democracy to a degree, but also look at long-term decision making, sensible, rational decision making for the long term rather than a four or seven year time span. So I think we've got to have some fundamental changes in our society in the way that we, we work. And that's going to take some major shocks to the system, I think, before that happens. But I think we're already starting, unfortunately, to see some of those shocks. I mean, when people start to run out of clean drinking water, when they start to you know, see catastrophic climate change, uh, you know, whether it's uh, things like Hurricane Katrina or things like that, they see the direct effects, then we have to hope people are going to start asking for change. And we have to make it a much more systemic change than just you know, sticking a Band-Aid over it and leaving it for tomorrow's generations to solve. Like part and parcel with the problem is, you know, the fact that it's our life support systems now that we're losing. You know, not just the fact that. You know, well, th that's right. I mean, I, I do, I do see it as, as sort of a brick wall. And you know, if you have a brick wall, you can pull out a few bricks, and the wall still stays there, and it's a bit more rickety, but it carries on. But you take out too many bricks, the whole thing collapses. And I think some of the systems now, we're putting so much shock to them from different areas that the uh, ability for sort of system failure is there. And we have to hope, I think, that we have some partial failures that give us enough of a wake up call to really renew our entire strategy as to where we're going on this planet. Otherwise, it, the cost, the human costs could be immense, the planetary costs could be immense, and ultimately we could end up with, without a home. It seems somewhere along the line, the most important thing everybody became the economy, the help of the economy. That, mm -hmm. that, that's the holy grail, that's God. It's not the mm -hmm. environment, it's not the health right. of citizens, it's nothing that right. happens. Well, I, you know, I think um, the old adage that uh, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, I think has changed into consumption is the opiate of the masses. Uh, I think people uh, see consumption as their route to happiness. And I think ultimately it's a fairly shallow route, but we're still finding that out. And of course, uh, you know, we've been doing this in the West for decades. Uh, we now have China and India coming on board who haven't had consumption. They've got a... Oh. Okay. Shared still. Do that. Sit. Ask me again. Yeah. Um, Cons yeah, con well... How did I ask? The economy, you said, you know, the economy yeah, is... the economy become yeah. the most important thing in terms of, instead of, like, the environment or our planet? I think we've we've come to a point where the old adage of Marx, I think it was, that said that uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. I think consumerism is the opiate of the masses now, and I think people see the equate um, uh, you know things um, with quality of life, and I think uh, that's a fairly shallow uh, goal to have. And I think uh, it's not necessarily a religious thing, it's perhaps a spiritual thing, but I think we have to realize that ultimately there are greater and better things than sheer physical goods, if you like. And um, that's what's driving a lot of the damage is this consumption and the desire to earn money to be able to consume more. And it's hard to see how that's going to change. I think it's going to take some very severe shocks to the system to change that. But if it doesn't change, it's hard to see how as a, as a species, ultimately, we'll survive. I think we've got a system too with, like, in the past there was revolutions that separated church and state, you know? Cause those two shouldn't have gone together. And now we've got a, you know, like corporate world mm -hmm. and state mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And like, they're running a lot. 
Yeah, there's, there's been, the, in recent decades, I think there's been a change in my lifetime, I've seen a change in values. And coming from the United Kingdom to the United States, I've seen another change in values. And I think after World War II, there was a great sense of people around the world getting together, working together to solve a problem. Everyone was a level playing field and that we should have a, a responsibility to look after each other. And I think since then it's gone the other way and it's every man for themselves. And in a finite planet with finite resources, every man for themselves is really a disastrous uh, doctrine to have. But that's where we're at. And, and unless that changes, it's hard to see other things changing in the right way. The change, like if, if humans are going to survive the next few hundred years mm. gracefully mm. in a world that looks like this, mm. how big of a change do you think is necessary? I think there's massive and fundamental changes are necessary because one of the things that we, we have to take into account is, um, you know, we're now at about 6.77 billion. We're going to have 10 billion in the next 10 or 15 years, I believe is the, is the thing. So there's going to be a lot more people. Um, there's already a lot less resources like forests and fish, for example, to feed those people. There's a lot less arable land for them to grow things on. There's a lot less water for them to, to cultivate. So we're going to be hitting some major, major crises. And the question is, I think, how do we try and change the world in a way that we can deal with this, that it's not uh, some kind of living hell, frankly, where so many people are going to be suffering on a daily basis and others will be cosseted and protected and better off than they've ever been before. And I just wonder if that's really the planet we want to live on. Yeah, it seems like every time throughout history, humans have been put into a scenario akin to the one we're going towards ended up eating each other. <laughs> well, we're certainly ending up fighting over things. And I think the reality is, is that the, the old wars used to be over land and, and political control. I think some of the new wars are going to be over resources. It's going to be over water supplies um, or over dwindling natural resources, whether it's fisheries or forests. Dogs. Yeah. Um, so we, there were some little successes that uh, that we were at least partially involved in this year, like Saipan and Guam, mm -hmm. um, where something really good happened out of people yeah. just becoming aware of the issue and, and pushing it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, somebody, oh, I won't say that. Uh, um, you know, we need, we need to get to those bigger goals. We need some success on the way. And uh, what always amazes me about the issues that I've worked on is, you know, you'll fight tooth and nail for years to get something through. And then once it's happened, within sort of six months or a year, everyone's like, even the opposition is like, yeah, great, fine, we move on. And, you know, the world didn't end. And so I think we're often scared about changing things and, and scared of change itself. And, uh, you know, it's really important that we have even small victories to keep us going for the long haul because it will be a real long haul to help the sharks or any other species out there. If there was one thing you'd want uh, the youth, young people, to know about these issues and what you're doing and what can be done to change mm -hmm. the fate of these animals, what would it be? If I had one message to children, it would be don't assume that the adults are going to take care of you and solve these problems. You're going to have to push them kicking and screaming over the line because I think as you grow up what you realize is uh, you know initially things seem very straightforward and very simple and very black and white and you think well why would anyone want to kill the sharks like this and then you realize the complexity of the world and the money behind it and also just the, the lack of movement the lack of change within things how difficult it is to change even a small law a small piece of legislation to protect one species it shouldn't be difficult but it is and so you know, children need to, with their sort of you know, a clear view of the world, need to really press their parents to, to take action because it's all too easy, I know as a parent, it's all too easy to be overwhelmed or to, to think there's so many other things out there. And, you know, we really need the support of the children to persuade their parents to take action now. Everybody comes away from these movies, these talks, mm -hmm. and they say, you know, what can we do? Mm -hmm. What can people do? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on the issue. Um, I think, you know, one thing which may seem easy and may seem trite, but is provides financial support for the people that are doing it on a professional basis. I'll do that. I'll say that again. What can people do? 
In some cases, you can take direct action yourself. You can contact your, your senator or your assembly member or whoever it is and try and take political action. You can certainly spread the word about what's going on and try and motivate other people to take action. You know, you can try and help raise money. Or nothing can be done without money. It's the reality of our planet. Um, so, whoop. Are you talking specifically to sharks or are you talking um, on a general basis? I don't know, I'm trying to get past this thing because like, I don't know, to me it seems obvious. You get like, something hurts you or you find out about something and you want to do something, yeah. do something about it. But yeah. everyone comes to Cam Wake from the movie Shark Water or something yeah. like that. They're like, what do we do? We don't yeah. know what to do, so we didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. Do something, pick up the phone. Right. Get in, write an email. You know? Right, right. It's just, I'm just trying to work whether you want to talk about a specific thing or yeah. a general thing. Um, uh, yeah. Well, okay. I'm, I'm more in the general respect. Yeah. Like, okay. How do you get involved? How do you become, become part of the solution? Right, right. Okay. So, how what do you, do you, like, how, what, what do people do? How do they become? I think we have to all try and get involved in whatever way we can. In some cases, there may be a piece of legislation you can support. You know, people often underestimate the power of calling a congressman, for example. Um, if you call your congressman about an issue, it does get registered, it does have an impact. Um, people can help with making a donation or helping to raise funds. I mean, every organization working to protect the environment needs, needs support. But people can also do things of their own lifestyle. I mean, if you live the life, uh, it, it communicates. But you have to think about what you buy. You know, I think um, we only get to vote if we're lucky once every four or five years, but every time you make a purchase, you're voting the kind of world you want. You're voting for the kind of product you want. So, you know, through your shopping, through your consumption, you can partly dictate the shape of the world to go. Oh, the sirens. I'll do the second half, shall I? I think that's right at the beginning, wasn't it, probably? I do like that, voting with your dollars. Yeah, no, I'll do that one then, yeah. Bap, 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 bap. <laughs> That's the cities though for you, you can't escape noise in the cities. No. Amazing when you get somewhere there's no noise, it's just so. You don't even you don't even hear it unless you're doing something like this. It blends into the background. Oh you hear that. <laughs> Couldn't they be more obnoxious? And now we've got two old ladies having a chat. Small dogs, and another one. <laughs> All colliding. She's quiet though. She's going to walk behind us though in a minute. Yeah, we'll do the, we'll do the vote in there. Okay. You may only get to vote once every four years, but every time you buy a product, you get a chance to choose the type of world you want. So buying from sustainable sources, from local sources, from low environmental impact sources, all shapes the world that we live in. And that really is, for most people, something they can do on a daily basis through their consumption. Um, now, just back to the sharks for, yeah. for a sec. Aren't there lots of laws in place? Like, aren't, aren't there, like, isn't shark finning illegal in most places? Well, the practice of shark finning, chopping off the fins and dumping the body is illegal in many jurisdictions. The trouble is, how do you enforce something that happens on the high seas, in the middle of nowhere, far from anybody? So what we find is if the demand is there and the market's there, people will just flout these regulations, whether they're restrictions on numbers of shark caught or whether it's anti-finning rules. What's the most important thing um, adults should know about these issues? Which issues? <laughs> Okay. Loss, yeah. of, loss of ecosystems yeah, yeah. and wildlife. I think the the I think we've almost got information overload and a kind of um, you know donor fatigue, if you like, about issues. There's so many issues out there. People tend to think, well, it's just I can't do anything about it. And if I had one message for adults is, please, you know, we have the responsibility. You know, they said the greatest generation was the one that went through World War II, but I actually think the challenges facing our generation are actually far, far greater. Um, you know, yes, that was a, a terrible war in which millions of people di died, but we now face a situation where we're potentially going to leave a, a, a partly devastated planet for our children, and that the challenge is there. We can't use ignorance as an excuse any longer. We know about what a lot of this stuff is going on, but we have to get the political will to act, and that's the key. That's our generation that's going to have to do that. How do we get the political will? 
how do we get the political <laughs> well the political the politicians ultimately listen to the people and uh, they'll only listen if we scream loud enough frankly there's so many issues out there the economic ones are the ones which tend to dominate the day but they're very much short-term issues and I think the difficulty is uh, you know understanding the sort of long-term effects of these problems um, and also that the sooner we address them the the cheaper the easier uh, the the more quickly solutions come in the longer you leave it the more dire the consequences okay. anything I haven't asked you that you think <laughs> the world and its problems we're fucked no I would say one more thing I gotta say one yeah I'll say one more thing yeah please it's very hard being an environmentalist because you're confronted on a daily basis with bad news and you have to keep a degree of optimism and ultimately I think you have to have a belief in human beings because much as we are the problem we are also the only solution and my feeling is is that of course everybody puts things off we all do I'm just as guilty we all make you know purchases and do things which damage the environment we've got to still keep that big goal in mind and we've got to still keep trying to save the world oh, I've lost that I've heard the bloody thing now we've got a fucking helicopter ferries planes biplanes kids dogs and helicopters okay so this is not such a good shooting spot yeah, Mental note. yeah. but I mean there's nowhere I mean you're gonna get if we'd been down there, yeah. you're gonna get this anyway. At least, at least the um, the Blue Angels aren't screaming across. Yeah. Slightly prettier, more relevant background than the park. Yeah. No, it is. Okay. Um, so I'll just try that one one more time, and then we'll call it call it a day. Like that one. Yeah, that's mm. one of the questions I normally ask everybody. Like, Are you optimistic at the end of it? Like, where do you find hope? Yeah. 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 All right, where do you find hope? Well, as an environmentalist, you know, you presented with really tragic information on a daily basis, and it's all doom and gloom if you're not careful. But I think you also have to look at what humanity is capable of in its finest moments, whether it's great uh, uh, tenderness or kindness, or when we've actually come together and cooperated, which usually is in crisis mode. Um, and that's got to be the hope and I think the hope is that we see uh, the warning signs sufficiently early and we're sort of catalyzed sufficiently to get our act together and really turn things around because we are blessed with you know this incredible planet which as far as we know nowhere else in the universe are these conditions for life existing right now that we can do this we've got to realize what a blessing that is and we actually have more in common and more we can do from working together than we can from competing and fighting with each other there, it seems to be like my my hope in all this is humanity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That like mm -hmm. there's something about humanity, whatever that word, word means, that we love tigers for a reason. Mm -hmm. that we love mm -hmm. people for a reason. We don't mm -hmm. want to see them suffer. You know? Do you think? How do you think that can help pull us? Well, I think if there is such a thing as as our humanity, then it has to. Surely the ultimate thing is not about our own self-interest, but about how we treat other species and the, the ultimate sign the ultimate test of our humanity is are we prepared to you know make some sacrifices to allow these other species to survive because if we're not I would suggest to you we're pretty inhumane